praise God that gave us the opportunity to reclaim again the powerful message of the gospel. In this conference, which I love so much, I see the pure motivation of everyone who speak and lift up Jesus Christ and his gospel. I am the farthest speaker. I come from Indonesia. Among all the speakers, I'm the only Asian speaker. When I speak in Mandarin, I am a lion. When I am speaking in English, I become a cat. <laughs> but if you go to preach in Mandarin or Indonesia, probably you become a rat. <laughs> so forgive me if my broken English is not satisfying you, but please take note the message is more important than the language. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Today, I'm going to talk to you about fuel by the mission. It's all about the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was a president in India whose name is Ratna Krishnan, and he was a philosopher. He said once, the Christians are those people who are ordinary people, but they think they have the extraordinary message to the world. I have thought of this sentence for many, many years. Finally, I come to a conclusion. He is wrong. We are not ordinary people that we think we have the extraordinary message to the world. We are ordinary people given by God the most extraordinary message to the world. Yeah. This world and the mankind will never have any news, any message better than a message of we are sinners, but God save all the sinners. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Gospel, what is gospel? Gospel is the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Other than, than these two pillars, there is no gospel. There is no good news. Good news is not in politics, in military, in weapons, in technology, in science, in anything else. The good news is only in the substitution death of Jesus Christ to replace us and to take all the wrath of God and save us and deliver us out from the power of Satan death and sin. That is the biggest and the most important good news and the only good news in the world history. We are not ashamed of this. Why we are not ashamed? Because that is the deepest and the profoundest wisdom and the glory of God within the gospel. We praise God. If you truly understand the glory of God in the cross, you are true Christian. If you never understand this, you may go out from the church, need not to call you a Christian. A Christian is a man who already experienced the powerful deliverance of the salvation in his own experience. A Christian is the one who knows why Christ died on the cross, because he is replacing me to accept all the wrath and all the punishment of God which I myself deserve to be on that place. That is gospel. Only gospel is the hope of mankind. Only gospel that can transform us from living on this earth and be living in heaven forever and ever. Yesterday, I talked to you about the kingdom come, kingdom go, kingdom grow, kingdom collapse, all the history are repeating the same thing years to years. And that is what Napoleon Bonaparte spoke once in the island of St. Helena. Hannibal, Julius Caesar, Charlie Mann, until I myself, we all built a great kingdom in this world that they will pass away forever. Only the one man who has no weapon, no narrow, no arrow, no canon, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He built his kingdom 
and his kingdom will never fail forever and ever until the end of the world. We praise God. This giant, Napoleon, tried to be the biggest military achievement in the world. He should be called the newer or the modern Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great never defeated because his war and his achievement in war is based on his mercy on men. I am not creating slaves in my war. I am delivering the slaves from the tyrants. That is the reason he's not afraid of the Persia because Persia has 500 times more bigger power in military than Alexander. And by Alexander, I told you yesterday, he's the only exception because God used him as a passive servant of God. By his preparation, the Greek language is going everywhere after he's defeating others. And that is the prior to the New Testament was written in Greek in order to be spread all over the world. We thank God for the preparation of God by using all kinds of tools, all kinds of enemies to be his passive servants to prepare the coming of Jesus Christ in the history. We thank God for all this. But when Jesus Christ come to history and come to die for us, he himself had already received the most tortured, the most difficult times and anything that human can bear in his life. Jesus was crucified and Jesus was also resurrected. Who nailed Jesus on the cross? Military, politicians, and lawyers, and economists, and all the most important people in this secular world, they are all the enemies of Christ. If Jesus died and then he never resurrected, it means that there's no hope for human beings because military can kill the Son of God. Politician can kill the Son of God. All the human power can kill the Son of God. Only the resurrection to assure that our God is a living God. Our God is a never defeated God. Our God is conqueror of everything because Jesus resurrected. And if we do not preach the resurrected Christ, we do not preach the dying and resurrected Christ to replace man's destiny. We are not the true and faithful follower of Jesus Christ. You are in the richest continent in the world. I'm living in one of the poorest continents in the world. But culturally, Asia is very important. I never invited, I was always invited to be the preacher in America. I never accept that. I know if God do not call me, I will not move my step for even one step. And that is the reason I keep living in Indonesia. I was not born in Indonesia. I was born in China, the most populous country in the world. And just two months before communists took over China, my mother was guided by the Lord to move to Indonesia. She was a widow when she was 33. At that time, I was only three years old. After six years old, after six years, my mother be a widow, then he thought God had guided her back to Indonesia, his birthplace. And I follow him, follow her to Indonesia until now. I never like to move to anywhere. I never seduced by any place. I never think any place better than God settled me in Indonesia. And I will make Indonesia better and better. I will make Indonesian people listen to the word of God. And by preaching the gospel, I have nothing, I have no money, I have no degree, I have no anything which can be boasted by me. In my life, you see the picture of the big church, even more seats than this church. In upper, the main sanctuary, 
and that down there, another second sanctuary, we can accommodate 6,000 people. And last year and this year, when I give the lecture and the seminar on Christology, the first from 9 o'clock to 5 o'clock of the afternoon, we give the topic of Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. And the second Christological topic, Jesus Christ, the priest, the prophet, and the king. And the third Christological topic is Christ, the God, the man, and the mediator. In coming 1st of April, I'm going to preach to more than 6,000 people again, Jesus Christ. He is the universal Christ, he's the historical Christ, and he's the Christ as the head of the church. We try to use the doctrine, doctrine to revive the people in Asia. I believe the true revival comprises five things. The first is doctrinal revival. Second is epistemological revival. And third is the ethical revival. And fourth is the ministerial revival. And fifth, most evangelical church, they do not think and do not insist important that is a revival of make Christ be preeminent above all culture of the human being. And in education, in economy, in politics, in all field of culture, Christ must be the master, must be preeminent. We praise God that put, God put me there in Indonesia. Indonesia is a crossroad of all religions. As what I say, Asian is the only continent which produces all great religions. That is not even one great religion produced in Europe or in, in, in America. All the great religion from Judaism, from Christianity and Muslims, and also Buddhism, Indian, Confucianism, Taoism, Sindhoism, all produce only in one country. And that is the reason Jesus said to Asian, I am the way. When Asian is seeking way, Jesus said, I am the answer. When European is seeking the epistemology and is seeking about the logic, Jesus said, I am the truth. And you religious founder died in the way seeking for the way. You philosophers die among the way when you are seeking for the truth. I am the life. To conclude, no religion can bring you to God. No philosophy can bring you to God. Only in my life, I give for you and I substitute you. I can bring you to heaven, to meet your God, to live together with him forever and ever. Jesus is the life because he's more than the way and the truth. The life, the life from heaven, the bread of life, from above, that we should eat him and we should follow him. Praise God. When Jesus came to the world, he didn't use the Greek authority of philosophy to teach. He didn't use the testament in old time of the Moses and all the Old Testament to be the axiom of the teaching to his, to his disciples. Jesus never in accord with the Platonic, Aristotelian, or Socratian teaching. He never go to the, all the Talmud, Talmud, Midrash, and other teachings of the Jewish people. But he set up a new school. I call him the School of Galilee. We praise God, and now in 2,000 years' time, we see the greatest influence to human being it's not from Greek, it's not from Hebrew, but from Galilean school. He has his own innovation, which is more than Greek, more than Hebrew. These are two pillars of the human civilization all over the world only bring us to the knowledge and to the wrong faith. But in Jesus Christ, we can have the true faith, true truth, true hope, true love, and also the true knowledge of God. We thank God. When Jesus was in the world, 
He called the people from Galilee, not from Greek people, not from descendants or the students of the Plato, Aristotle, or Socrates, Zeno, Democritus, and other Greek philosophers. He didn't teach us about all the tradition of the Hebrew people, but he gave his own life, his own truth to set a new path for us to go to heaven. Likewise, in the time of Geneva, when Calvin teach, he didn't use the system of Cambridge, Paris, Bologna, Heidelberg, or other universities of Europe. When Geneva settled down by Calvin, he used only the Bible to teach the people of his time to know God, and he changed the world. Now, when I ask you, who is the bigger influence in this world, Aristotle, Socrates, Confucius, Buddha, or Jesus? We are sure only Jesus gives the biggest influence to the human being. And his, his, his influence is all good, nothing bad, nothing evil. In compared with other religion, Christ is the only truth, the only wisdom, and only love from God. We thank God for that. So Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. If your uncle was hung on the cross, or your son was shot to death, and after your friends go to the electric, electric chair, and can you say, electric chair, electric chair is always my glory? No one will say that. Shot to death, shot to death is my glory. No one can say that. Only Christian, we are crazy people. <laughs> because we say, cross, cross is my glory forever and ever. Amen? Yeah. Praise God. This is the most ridiculous and most paradoxical truth in the Bible. The paradoxical truth in Jesus Christ is the only hope who turn the, this world upside down in value, in concept, in everything. Jesus Christ and his cross becomes the glory of Christian faith. When Jesus was born in manger, he was born to the most humble, most poorest situation. At that time, the angels say, glory to God. When Jesus said, glorify your son, oh, Father, just that your son had already glorified you, then the big sound comes from heaven. I have glorified my name. I will glorify again through you. And what is the next glory? Next then, when Jesus born, glory to God in the highest. Another glory is the glory of the cross of Jesus Christ. It is shameful. It is so low, so poor, so despised, rejected by men. No one ever on the cross. No one ever can see the cross of glory. Only Christians. When you truly understand the wisdom of God is in the cross of Jesus Christ. The mercy of God is in the cross of Jesus Christ. And the righteousness of God is in the cross of Jesus Christ. The wrath of God is accepted in the cross of Christ. Then you know the grace of God only comes out from the one who has been crucified. Cross is the vacuum place of love in the universe. In the whole universe, there's one point which is vacuum of love. No man's love can come to the cross because when we come to cross, we bring our love to Jesus Christ. Our love is hindered but our sins. Our sins go first and our sins crucify Christ and our love cannot be on the cross. Cross is the only place when no love of God can come because when God's love comes to his only begotten son, he say, my God, my God, why have you for forsaken me? Cross is the only place, the only vacuum place of love in the universe. And that is the reason cross become the original place of the true love forever and ever. Because Jesus Christ 
except all the wrath of God in His own body who was hung on the cross for you and for me. And that is the reason God made Christ the new source of love, the new source of grace forever and ever. Praise God. I am not ashamed of the cross. I am not ashamed of the gospel because in gospel, I myself believe Jesus was naked when he was hung on the cross. They took his coat outside and took his also inside coat. That is belief that I believe he was naked. He put into shame the most shameful stages of human being in the history is the Son of God when he was hung on the cross. And when he say, Father, forgive them, he is not saying something that if you do not know about your sin, you are sinless. Because if Jesus say, forgive them, it means that you can forgive them only through my suffering. You only give them, forgive them, only because I die for them. Socrates say, a man commits sin because he does not know. It seems very similar to Jesus Christ saying on the cross, but different is when Socrates say this sentence, probably he is now lying on his bed, thinking speculative on his the logic, but he never understand what is the meaning of sin. Jesus say, sin against you. I pray to you, forgive them because I died for them. This is a complete understanding. It's a very accurate understanding of the, what is the sin, what is punishment, and what is the substitution of the love of God through Jesus for forgive us. And in the fourth words, fourth sentence on the cross, Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the first sentence, he said, Father. The seventh sentence, he said, Father. The middle one, fourth sentence, he said, God. Why? The first sentence and last sentence, he is doing the will of his Father who sent him to be the Savior, to be the only mediator between God and man. So he said, my Father, forgive them. My Father, I give my life in your hand. He accomplished the saving grace, accomplished the saving plan of God to replace man. But in the fourth sentence, he didn't say, Father. He didn't say, Father, just like in the first sentence or in the final sentence. He said, my God, my God. He died in the situation and the status of a man who replaced other men. He replaced us and he died. God cannot die. God is not able to die. Only man can die. But when he say, Father, he is in the status of Son of God. When he say, Father, I give my life into your hand, he is talking that in the status of God, the Son of God. But when he say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is speaking this on behalf of man. And he is in the status of being a man. No other gospel besides Jesus Christ. If you believe, you accept any gospel different the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ preached by Paul, that you are sure not a Christian. That is the reason Paul said, I don't care who tell you other gospel. Even if he's an angel, he still is lying to you. That must be cursed if you don't believe only in Jesus and his crucifixion. We praise for God. We have the jewel, we have the diamond, we have the most important treasure in the whole universe. The death of Jesus Christ becomes our hope, becomes our life, becomes our love to God. If you don't love God, you must be cursed. And if you love God, God knows who is the one who truly loves him. Amen? Praise the Lord. Because Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected for us, so we should truly encourage ourselves to preach this. This is very ridiculous, very paradoxical, very unreasonable to be understood by human beings. But all the wisdom of God is consistent 
in this the paradoxical truth of the cross of Jesus Christ. Who can be a preacher? Who can proclaim the salvation of Jesus Christ as if he himself ever experienced the power of the Holy Spirit? If a man never experienced the power of the gospel, he must not. He is not able to preach any word to introduce Jesus Christ. And a man who has, has already experienced the power of the gospel, he needs to study the gospel to know how profound, how deep, how rich, how abundant is the truth of God and the wisdom of God which is hidden in the shameful cross of Jesus Christ. So first, experience the power in changing you, transforming you to be the Son of God. And after that, you truly learn, truly study about the cross with your mind, with your heart, and you truly fall in love with the gospel, then you preach the gospel. Secondly, you should epistemologically understand the depth of the truth of the cross. And thirdly, you should be motivated by the power of Holy Spirit. Because Holy Spirit is given to this earth to lift up Christ, to witness for Christ, and He is a true testifier to recommend Christ to human beings. If that is not the work of the Holy Spirit, not even one man can call Jesus Lord. In Roman Empire, there is a rule, the emperor is the owner of all the citizens. The emperor is the Lord of all Roman citizens. That is the reason when you say, Lord to Jehovah, they can forgive you. Because they know it, it's not easy to make the Jewish people turn away from their faith and their religion and to call only Caesar as their Lord. So they try to make one country two system. One country system in practice by Deng Xiaoping is not original. It is an imitation of the Roman Empire. Roman Empire first say, okay, for Jewish people, you can call Jehovah the Lord. But for other people other than Jewish people, anybody who call God, who call others as Lord, must be beheaded. But when Jesus Christ to be called Lord by the Christians, then the constitution of Roman Empire changed. If you call Jesus Lord, you must be beheaded. That is the reason from the first to the fourth century, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Christians be hated, burned on the stake. They die for Christ. They die for gospel because they know Jesus is the only Lord, not the Caesar, not the emperor of the Roman Empire. Only Jesus Christ, the one who was born in the manger, was died on the cross, the most humble and the most tortured and Moses suffering God is the true Lord, true master of our life. We praise God. The most humble Jesus has changed the concept of value in the history. The most tortured Jesus has become the king of kings to replace all kings. More than anyone else, the first called king of kings in the history is Nebuchadnezzar. And the final one who called himself the king of kings is Katafi the crazy Qaddafi. that you know where is he now? He died like a dead dog. He died dying so shameful. All the different way of the Satan and the Son of God, Satan tried to lift up himself, to ascend and ambition to be replaced God. But finally, he was put down, cast out from the heaven and cast down on the earth. That is Satan. Christ is so different. He humbled himself initiatively and he was lifted up, glorified passively. Everybody call himself a Christian. If you don't understand the rule of these spiritual principles, you are vowed and you are be forsaken. We praise God. Anyone who humble himself will be lifted up by God. Anyone who lifts up himself will be humiliated by God. That is the rule in the Bible. Christ, through his suffering, his humility, 
and he's the tortured, and also he's died on cross. He become resurrected. He become ascended on the heaven, and he will be glorified forever and ever. This is the will of God. We praise God. This Christ is worth to worship. This Christ is worth to preach. And all over the world need the message of crucified Christ and the resurrected Christ because he is the only one who is worth it to be called the King of Kings. So after you have been motivated by the Holy Spirit, you call him Lord. You submit yourself to him and your whole life is owned by him and controlled by him and also reigned by him. That you are now his people, his soldier, and his representative to preach his gospel to the world. What is the true motivation of preaching the gospel? The first, because to preach gospel is the will of God. Calvin once said, nothing is greater than the will of God except God himself. Only God who determined everything by setting his will on the whole world. God had the, his will to create so they are creatures. God has his own will to redeem so they are the people of God. They have his planning to reveal that there will be the Bible and the understanding of the word of God. The creation, redemption, and revelation done by the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, these all things happen on this earth make us understand who our God is. Make us know He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is the truth who revealed Himself to us. Praise God. So Holy Spirit, let us understand the will of God. And the will of God is the first motivation to preach the gospel. Second motivation, why we preach the gospel? Because it, that is the commandment of Jesus Christ. Go to the whole world. Preach the gospel to the nations and teach them what I have taught you. And I will be with you until the end of the world. In Bible, there's two verses concerning God be with us. The first is in the time of Jesus' birth. This is called Emmanuel, God with us. The second is for people who truly go to preach the gospel and I will be with you forever and evermore. Birth of Jesus Christ and the commandment of Christ assure God be with us. We all like the word Emmanuel. So many churches, church Emmanuel, Emmanuel, but I don't think every church call them church is church. I don't think every call him Emmanuel experienced the presence of God within them. There was one church when inauguration there's one sentence on the pulpit, outer piece called Jesus, only Jesus. But after 10 years, the wind blow and some of the letters come down and finally, the J is no more. E is no more. S is no more. And it can be read as only us. The first, only Jesus. Finally, only us. Now a day in so many churches, you do not listen to the word of God. You listen to the sound and the voice of money. In all the churches, you do not listen to the sentences from the Bible. You listen to the voice of men, of human beings, of millionaire, of people who are so powerful in the church, but no more God reigning in the church. We should repent from that. When I build this church, I say to the Lord, I'm not going to raise funds. And now you see the big church. It's one of the biggest in Asia, one of the biggest reformed church in the world. And that church can accommodate 6,500 people. We never borrow one penny from bank. We never go to any millionaire to ask money. I just share, we need to build a church for people to worship. Now we come, commit yourself, and write down what, how much money you have to give. You pray, 
at you right now. Finally, after months and months and months, building two years, we finished all the building, and after finish, I asked the committee how much money still we want. They say to me, no money we want. All have been paid. The big church like that, no fundraising. In all my life, I have never fundraising. I have never asked money. I never visited a millionaire or rich people, please help me, help me. I have a program like this. No, my mouth has been committed to preach only the gospel. My mouth is not assisting to ask money from any people. Praise the Lord. Even this time, I say, this is a big opportunity for Asian people to work together with the American people. So I come. I do not want to reimburse my ticket. I do not want to accept any honorarium. I come here for the Lord, not for anything else. Praise God. And you know, and may I ask Dr. Yaya Ling to write a check of $5,000 as a contribution from our church in Jakarta to contribute to this conference, which is so great and so lovely. I only make this decision in this morning. I love the conference. I love all the speakers. I love every message spoken from this pulpit. It is all the word of God being lifted up. The glory of Jesus Christ and his gospel being, being glorified. We praise God. May God bless us. So I continue. The third motivation is by the constraint of the Holy Spirit. Constrained by the Holy Spirit. Constrained by the love of Christ. So we cannot stop there. We cannot stop and do not preach the gospel. To preach gospel is not to preach to our children. To preach gospel, to preach to the unreached people. That is the reason I was located by God in Asia, in the continent which is so proud. Asia produced the highest degree of the civilization. Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, Shintoism, all these complete and a very, very, very perfect system of the civilization because people there should be so arrogant, so proud, and they are not easy to submit themselves to the crucified Christ. And that is the reason I was put there in Asia. I think my challenge is more than Martin Luther. <laughs> Martin Luther only faced Catholic. I have, to f <laughs> I have to face, I'm not joking, I have to face communism, I have to face atheism, I have to face existentialism, I have to face all the ide ideology after the so-called enlightenment. Before Reformation, there was Renaissance. After Reformation, there was enlightenment of Clairon. And Reformation is just like the most important part in the sandwich. And Reformation is only several decades of years and face the radicalism and face also the, the, the protest of the Catholicism but that is 500 years ago. Now in Asia, we are facing the monsters of Mohammedanism, monsters of communism, monsters of secularism, monsters of American consumerism. You are invading us, but your com consumerism, that is terrible. People, they have their church. Where is your church located? Shopping mall. They have their God, that is money. They have their entertainment, that is Hollywood. They have every kind of thing now invading in Asia. In Asia, I'm living in the most populous Mohammedan in the world. In Indonesia alone, more than 210 million of Muslims. Christians only 8% and Catholics together, about 12% of the total population in the biggest country of Muslim inhabitants, I build the biggest church in Asia. Praise God. When I lift up the cross on top of the church, 
it is 66 meters high. Why? Because Bible is 66 volume. <laughs> and I put sola scriptula, sola fide, sola gratia, solus Christus, and solidio gloria on top of the building. Everybody who go there, they can see, they can read the five slogans of the Reformation. We are not commemorating 500 years, but we put all the principle of the Reformed theology on top of our building. And in the middle, there's Christ, the highest point of the whole church. Besides Christ, six and six, 12 pillars indicates the 12 apostles. And beside 12 apostles, four fortress tower, Matthew, Marcus, Luke, and John, to indicate we preach four gospels content to the world by 12 pillars as the Christ built his church through his disciples. And then on the other side of the church, we have another 12 pillars indicates the 12 most important prophets in Old Testament and another four fortress tower that is Calvin, Martin Luther, and also Abraham and Moses. Now we now keep this building to this world, to this generation, that people understand whom are we believing? What are we believing? We believe the Apostle Creed. We believe the whole Bible. We believe the teaching of Jesus Christ. On the middle Gothic shape of the tower, there is the first point. I call it, it as the creation point. And the cross, the center point, is a redemption point. And Alpha and Omega, there is one point called the consummation point. From the creation, redemption, until the consummation that is only done by Trinity, our only God. Praise the Lord. God is the one who created. Jesus is the one who uh, redeemed us. And Holy Spirit is the one who revealed all this to us. And we know all the truth only through the revelation of God in the Bible. When the Holy Spirit motivates us, we preach the gospel. We never preach the gospel only by money. I'm so, I am so strange to see the mission in the Western world. If you don't have money, you never send your missionary upward. But Jesus never give one penny to buy American ticket, uh, American Airlines ticket. Oh, John, you go to this place. Peter, you go to that place. Andrew, you go to Egypt. And Thomas, you go to India. No ticket, no money, no anything to support their mission. That is Jesus. Now, a day very different. A man who wants to join to be the missionary of one church in America. I do not tell you what church. I ask him, how much money you should raise every month in order to be qualified to be sent as a missionary. He said, I should raise up 11000 every month. $11,000 to the church. And church give me privilege to be missionary, go to China. I say, how much money they pay you? He answered me, they pay me 3000 And you raise up 11000 for the American church. And American church give you 3000 to go to China. May I ask you, who is feeding who? Are you feeding the church or the church feeding? He said, I'm confused. If he is confused, I am almost confused by him. I don't understand. What are we doing now? In the day of Jesus Christ, no money, no support, no military power, no more political status, nothing in backing them. The only thing is the power of Holy Spirit, the fire of Holy Spirit, it will change the world. So today, we should be filled, not by money, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Since my 17 years old, when I was 17, at that time is two years after I prayed to God, if you are true God, please save me. Deliver me out from the ideology of communism, of Atheism, of evolutionism, of dialectical materialism. When I was young, 
I supposed to be one of the most intelligent young men in my age at that time. And I tried to get away from the Bible, get away from the church, even though I know my mother is one of the most godly person in the world. She becomes a widow when I was three years old. With the eight children, he raised up by work very hard from early morning, six o'clock, until eight o'clock in the afternoon. No husband, no support, no social welfare. Do everything to raise up eight children in the time of Sino-Japanese war. Who can understand? No insurance, no money, no support, no relative can help us. Only depend on God. She cried and said, God, you are the father of the orphanage, and you are the defender of a widow. Now I come to you. I commit all my children to you. They are yours. You entrust them to me. I'm going to grow them up by only defend, de depending on your power. Praise God. When my mother was old and she see for her eyes truly the guidance of God, among seven brothers of my, my family, five become preachers. I am only one among five to serve the Lord full time. And I serve God since 17 years, first time preaching until now, 77 years old. I have been preaching for 60 years and more. Praise the Lord. My God is true God. My God is a living God. My God is faithful God. I am not talking only the God of American, God of the universe, God of Asian people, God of the people in China, in Indonesia. So many people never know God, but I know God. I experience God. My God is truly honest and truly providing everything for those who believe in Him. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because that is the dynamic from God, the dynamo from God in gospel is the power to save for those who believe in God. We should believe this with all our hearts, with all our mind, all our strengths, all our nature, and to say to God, let the living gospel become living again in our generation that the fire of the Spirit burn again in our hearts. One of the most important sentences spoken by Martin Luther, who aflamed me and who burned in my heart, is the sentence. It says like this. Martin Luther said, I never worked better than when I was inspired by the holy anger of God. Well, I was so amazed. I was so amazed by this sentence. Finally, I think it over and over, and I should say, yes, that is truly, absolutely right. I am also never worked better than when I was inspired by the holy anger of God. In Psalm 90, who knows your anger? Who knows the Lord that you are anger? You are the God of righteousness. Who knows about your holiness? The one who really understand the holiness of God, understand the holy anger of God, he can be used by God with the power of the Holy Spirit. Now a church is always coming to the comfort zone and we enjoy our life with our consumer, with our money, with our richness. But we should remember a lot of Christians, our brothers, they are in the fire, in the torture, in the persecution, in Iraq, in Syria, among people who are in the place of ISIS, they are tortured. In India, in Hindu, in Bangladesh, so many Christians, our brothers, they're in the troubles. We American people, we are too comfort and we are too free. We have everything can be enjoyed the best in the world, but do not, remember, do not forget. For me, all mankind is my same kind. All Christians are my brothers. All Christians, my friends. All evangelicals are my brothers. 
All reformed people are my comrades. And I divide all people into four classes. Not four classes in Indian society. The four classes, my same kind. I pray for them. I preach to them. I hope and expect them come to receive Jesus Christ. But after they be, become Christians, I know all Christians are my friends. My friends, not yet my brother. Except they receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, truly redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, truly purchased by the blood shed on the cross of Jesus Christ, that I call them brother. But when they understand the sovereignty of God, they understand the predestination of God, they understand the grace of God, that I call them reformed brothers, they are my comrade. And I'm so glad I'm now preaching among my comrades. I'm preaching among my brothers, and you are all my brothers. I praise God for that. I want to tell you, and I want to urge you, I want to remind you, return to the Calvary. Return to the place where Jesus was crossed. If cross is not coming here, we go back to cross, or ask God to put a cross, and the dying of Jesus Christ has a striving power, a driving motivation, for us to preach the gospel, that we say, Jesus, yes, I am yours. Praise God. I still have about six minutes to go. I will tell you some of my experience. When I was 17, I tell God, answer all my questions. Deliver me out from all the human ideology, which is so opposing you and your word. And God answer me. If you answer my question, I will go to all over the world to answer all the questions of people. I have been visiting 132 cities in the United States alone, more than your president. <laughs> but I tell you, I never go to visit any famous people, rich people, not even one. Even though I'm reformed, I never come to any place to see the famous people. Why? Westminster gave me a doctorate, I don't know until now. But that is my initiative. They want me to come to accept the honorary doctor, doctor, doctor of divinity. I come just because I think it is better to be known as a reformed people, not only self-proclamation. And then Westminster come by their initiative, not my mind, come to Jakarta to have an MOU with my seminary and then Free University of Amsterdam, by their own initiative, they come to have MOU with my seminary. And the Abaddon University come by their initiative to have MOU with my seminary. And also, another Kempen University in Netherlands, by their own initiative, they come to have an MOU with us. I never took initiative to see, to meet, and to ask anything from the world. I never ask money. I never ask degree. I never ask any glory. I never ask any honor. I just lift my head in the hand of God. I lay my life in the hand of God. And for 17 years old, first time God gave me and I become a preacher. And then in Netherlands, in other places, and half years ago, I visited eight most famous university in the United States including UC Berkeley and Stanford and Kemp and also Columbia, MIT, Harvard to answer all the questions of the intellectuals, to let them have the true faith and a very good foundation in the Bible. Now I'm old, I'm still going everywhere. If somebody say you should come, I pray. The peace of God is my heart. I go to preach gospel because I am not mine. I am in the hand of God. I am His forever and ever. May the fire of Holy Spirit once again to burn us and to make us on fire to preach gospel. And American people, especially reformed people, you should go to preach to the unreached people, not only to your children, because they have been given the grace to be born in the Christian family. But those who Muslims, who Confucianism, communists, 
atheists, who Hinduists, who have never known about Jesus Christ. In my preaching to the millions of people in Indonesia, I say, Muhammad never died for the Muslims. Confucius never died for Asian or for, for Chinese. And also Taoists never died for the Taoists. All the religious founders, all the philosophers of the ideology of human beings, they only live for their own struggle. Only Jesus is the one who died for all the men in the world, that you can come to him and believe him. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because in the gospel is the power of God to save everybody who believe in him. May glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.